how to enter a place, or arm positionality. Enter like an unemployed elephant, which is to say, begin to wonder what an unemployed elephant might need upon entering. Begin by building a ramp. A ramp that allows one to overcome one's own inclinations. Begin by not knowing, not knowing whether you have entered, when you may have entered. Begin by being sure you will not know when exit has been achieved. Someone will have to tell you to point it out, or to point up, and for you to look out instead. An act of defiance that might lead you to a moment of knowing that you have entered, that you are inside. Begin with the assumption that you were always already inside. Your task is not to enter, but to move already from within. I've been making uh, lecture performances over the past five years as a vehicle to communicate. Uh, fairly complex and weaving work that comes of an ongoing now 15-year uh, engagement with a small glass factory town in Sweden. Over the course of this week work, uh, I had a child, like many people, who entered the place of my life and deeply influenced it in every conceivable way. It seemed obvious to me to let her in. I saw her as my teacher. At the age of five, I made a concerted effort to get her authorized as my doctoral supervisor. When people have asked me why I use my daughter in my performances, I've struggled to find a satisfying answer. As I prepared this audio clip for you today and thought to myself, why do I want to enter this room in Sydney, Australia, led by the voice of my then seven-year-old child? I found myself thinking about the work of a colleague that I often share when working with students who are newer to the field. It's a piece made by the Portland, Oregon-based artist Harold Fletcher that he made in 2006 at a chateau and sculpture park in Brittany, France. Harold was asked to make a work for their park, mostly full of minimalist metal monuments. And he decided to ask visitors to the park what they thought should be in the park. Those who had ideas, uh, he asked them to precise them by making a drawing, specifying dimensions and materials. One eight-year-old boy named Quarantine proposed a work in the form of a solid gold turtle painted green. Harold had found his work and went about the process of giving his commission over to an eight-year-old Quarantine to produce this solid gold turtle painted green as his contribution to the park. <laughs> As I was looking at the documentation of this project the other day with some of my students in Helsinki, I was struck by the strong surrogacy I saw in it, that alongside the more obvious layers of value interrogation, come on in, you're welcome, no problem, and institutional critique, there is this strong element of surrogacy. The way that quarantine stands in for the child we all bring with us into each site and situation we enter. It seems also worth noting that there is something in the roles accorded to the artist, the permissions we are granted, that contains this shamanistic element, this permission to transit temporal life stages, to bring the knowings of the child into the realm of the adult. I can feel the exercising of this permission in my desire to enter this room in this way. The ways in which Novi, my daughter, stands in for my own sense of self as I enter a new place. I'm chatting with the Ugandan curator, Sarabiri Moses, while preparing this talk, reflecting with him on performances of knowledge. I tell him I was listening to Eshir Mbembe, the Cameroonian political theorist and public intellectual, deliver a lecture, and thinking about the performance of knowledge and his deep knowings sitting alongside my ambivalence about my knowing anything. This ambivalence is different from insecurity. 
It is one of the deep teachings I received from being a witness to my daughter's development. This state of total uncertainty without a trace of the anxiety uncertainty often produces in, in adults. The capacity to inhabit a state in which even the most basic knowing is in doubt and contingent. Knowing exists simultaneously without strife alongside not knowing. This state that children can inhabit so intuitively at a particular moment in life feels like a profound truth worth pausing on as we embark on this exploration of how to enter a place, particularly in an academic institution dedicated to the pursuit of knowledge and simultaneously deeply attached to certain philosophies of knowing. To clarify this a little further, there was a brief, beautiful period when my daughter would frame almost any statement as a question, like, this is a cup? Or we are together? And there we were, together and not together. In the truth of this state she was inhabiting and declaring. Here we are in that state, attempting to think how to enter a place. I've been doing this work for a little while now, and like anyone who has done anything particular for long enough, you wind up in a somewhat lonely place. And it can be hard to figure out how to invite someone into the questions you are inhabiting. I'm trying my best, so if I fail, maybe you can help. I introduced this work I have been doing in an online seminar that was part of the Gilbert Fellowship in early May of this year. In that talk, I tried to bring the online audience into the work through a book I worked on, this one here, that has been uh, released recently. Today, I'd like to try a slightly different method, but as many of you were not at the seminar, I will present some of the same work. The works I make have a lot of layers and they are not one thing. They don't have a point and they don't yet know what they know, which is not to say they don't know anything. So this work that we are doing here today is very important. And my hope would be that you could adopt a posture of being with the work as a curious, vulnerable being that knows and does not know. This is, I think, why questions and live presentation remain so important. They are an opportunity to destabilize the attempt to know the work that my presentation inevitably performs. So I look forward to being with the work with you. On a map, you could find Ramira here. You actually can't see the space between Ramira and here on a spherical map without moving. But here it is, and here it is in the more conventional orientation. Surrounded by lakes and forest in the region of Ostrjotland a small factory town of about 900 people. If anybody doubts the uh, ideological position of Google Earth, this is its default setting. <laughs> mm. You might ask how I wound up in such a place. I was born on Google's default world map in New York. And despite being asked many times, I don't have a very satisfying answer to how I wound up spending so much time in this place. I first came to Raymira and to Sweden in 2007 on a post-World War II US Department of State sponsored grant program known as the Fulbright Program. I was there as an artist and researcher to explore collective art practices in the Nordic countries and received an invitation from two very new colleagues to come to Raymira as my first stop, where they had recently purchased a house and were inviting a group of artists to come and explore the site, their new home. It was a hectic first year with a lot of activity centered around the glass factory. 
And the normal course of events would likely have made this a one-time engagement. For a variety of reasons, I've kept coming back. And at some point in my artistic development, I realized that it was a better place than many to make art and to develop my thinking around site responsive practice. So now 15 years later, I am still actively working in Raymira, having founded an artist run long-term place-based research project there among other things. Before I get back to Ray Mira, I think it would be helpful to show work from another context, a little closer to our present location. It's important to note that these works I will be showing overlap as my now going on 15 year relationship with Ray Mira was never agreed to be monogamous. This is a map I made of the site um, I explored uh, in this project. From uh, 2013 to 2015, as part of a residency-based art commissioning program in Western Australia called SPACED, I worked in the iron ore mining town of Tom Price. The way the SPACED biennial works in the Australian context is through an open call to rural communities to host resident artists for two-year engagements. It's an unusual structure where the community is your host, and thus, while your contract is with the Perth-based arts organization Spaced, your contact is primarily local. Your commission is to make a work that has its primary manifestation within your site, but must also produce a work for exhibition at a major institutional show at the conclusion of the three-year period. When I was offered the commission, Marco Marcon, the curator, presented a few different communities as options. As someone who grew up diving with a deep love of the ocean, it took a certain amount of discipline and perhaps a dose of masochism to resist the offer of certain coastal sites and instead choose the inland iron ore mining community of Tom Price. But I was drawn to this strange set of contradictions and conditions that Tom Price represented. Rural but wealthy and in many ways developed, a place where most of the residents did not identify as of the place, and also to the town with this distinctly plain Protestant American name, Tom Price. So this map is composed of uh, three road maps, uh, one of Los Angeles, California and its outskirts, one of uh, Inner Mongolia, and one of uh, a roadmap of Western Australia that locates Tom Price. Tom Price is a purpose-built, time-delimited community, wholly owned by the multinational mining giant Rio Tinto. It is a container for human life meant to self-destruct after 50 years that has reached the end of its planned duration but is having trouble accepting its fate. It is one of the wealthiest rural towns in the world with five schools, an Olympic sized swimming pool and recreation facility and a mostly unused art center on the outskirts of town. It is full of families on five year plans to make some money for a down payment on a home in Australia's skyrocketing real estate market. While there, they live in company houses and send their children to schools with Rio Tinto backpacks, Rio Tinto erasers, eating Rio Tinto jelly beans. On the other side of town, within the gated confines of the Tom Price mining operation, there are fly-in, fly-out workers in labor camps dealing with the new psychological strains of this labor practice created by the mining industry. A bit further outside of town, there are independent contractors living in caravan parks and tourists on their way to visit Karajini National Park, stopping for a mine tour. A bit further still, there are Aboriginal communities where approximately 10% of the Aboriginal population has decided not to live in the town of Tom Price. These places are full of people who have lived to see the dawning of the unmanned mining era. Their dwarfed bodies made fit by the rec recreation hall sit inside enormous machines while the same machine next to them is controlled effortlessly 
by a joystick from Perth. Into this space I enter as an artist in residence tethered to the intentionally faulty joystick of the Perth-based operation spaced and a guest of the Shire of Ashburton. I'm an American artist in a town founded by American greed and named after an American man who purportedly made it all happen. Tom Price was founded in the late 1960s. One story tells us of a letter Thomas Moore Price wrote back to Henry Kaiser of the great American steel company, Kaiser Steel, based in Fontana, California. The letter he wrote as he flew over the Pilbara included this statement. God made these mountains of iron ore, and if we can't make a mountain of money from them, then God will have wasted his time. <laughs> this got things moving back at Kaiser Steel, where they were building a great monument to American industry in the form of a $267 million steel manufacturing plant, the most advanced the world had seen. With time, the iron ore flowed from a mine and town, both named Tom Price, to this facility in California. But by the early 1980s, most of the American steel industry and Kaiser Steel along with it was bankrupt. Kaiser sold the great Kaiser Steel Mill along to a, uh, uh, for, uh, for about a tenth of what they paid to build it, around $20 million, to Beijing Capital Iron and Steel, who launched into a plan to send 300 workers from China to Los Angeles to take the mill apart piece by piece and float it to southern China, where it would once again take shape. The 300 workers arrived and lived in a hotel surrounded by a high fence due to fear of American racism and the Ku Klux Klan. It took them a year, but they accomplished their task and the mill floated back to China, where it lingered in pieces in several suburbs, waiting out intense opposition by several of the proposed host communities in China to the environmental impact of resurrecting it near their homes. Finally, it found a new willing recipient in the industrial city of Baotou, Inner Mongolia, where it now stands, operates, and continues to receive its iron ore from the town of Tom Price, Western Australia. During my first month-long research residency in Tom Price, I shared a home with a contract manager for Rio Tinto. She lived uneasily during my time there with the threat of being laid off in the latest round of massive layoffs. There were three rounds during my time in Tom Price affecting Rio's sprawling mining operation in the region, of which Tom Price is just one part. The last layoff was of 3,000 people, the size of the entire workforce of the Tom Price mine. During this period, while everyone was else uh, around me went to their shift in the mine and ate Rio Tinto meals or to teach at Tom Price's five schools or to their public service positions at the Shire, I lived my odd little life, taking night and early morning walks in the spectacular desert landscape, reading through the archives of the town, meditating, cooking, and accepting every invitation that came my way to engage with the people around me. I became friends with a local radio broadcaster and convened some sound workshops in nearby communities. It was a hard place to be a beggar as the curator characterized the role of the resident artist in his program. To beg in a place where everyone has come to get rich and to have their time valued. From the site understood to include me, I culled a series of narrative fragments, little pieces of story about the size of a single chunk of high-grade iron ore. In order for a mining operation to proceed, to be economically worthwhile, the iron ore must be a minimum of 65% pure. I applied this same metric to the quality control of the stories I mined from the site. I then sent these mined minimum 65% pure fragments of story off to China to be processed by a Chinese opera company and a landscape painter into a classical Peking opera and a Chinese landscape painting that each told the complex story of this town, founded in American greed and ambition, and spending its last years servicing an aging American steel plant in China's Inner Mongolia. 
For my follow-up residency period, I attended final rehearsals with the Chinese Opera Company in Taiwan, met with the landscape painter, and later on in the month, brought the Chinese Opera back to Tom Price to be performed for the Tom Price community at the foot of Mount Nameless, the mountain that divides the town from the mining operation. The landscape painting was sent directly from the painter to the Western Australian Museum for an exhibition in the spring of 2015. These are some images of the, the poster for the opera in the local Coles. These are the uh, two main characters in the opera. This is Tom Price on our right and uh, Shirley Price's daughter on our left. Uh, it's a challenging thing to translate um, uh, this kind of uh, work into uh, Peking opera because there are only stock characters. The scene from the uh, recounting of the letter that I read earlier. And some process images of uh, working with the landscape painter to develop those works. This is an early sketch for the Fontana steel mill and the shipping of the components, the boats being used to ship the components. And this is a rendering of the final uh, Fontana mill uh, panel of the Mount Nameless uh, Tom Price panel and the uh, Bow to Inner Mongolia panel. Final rendering of the triptych as it was exhibited uh, at the Western Australian Museum in, in Perth, along with the documentation of the opera. As I look back on the results, I realized that I was doing something that the poet and play playwright Eric N. refers to as developing a production process capable of editing out the influence of my impure imagination. I sent these narrative fragments full of things I found intriguing. You may have read some while I was speaking. Off to China, and they sent back scripts for what were essentially tribute narratives, tributes to Tom Price and the legacy of uh, Kaiser Steel, stripped of overt criticality and embellishments. Making a contemporary Peking opera is also challenging, as I was saying, as there are no new characters in this aging form. So the characters of Tom Price and his daughter Shirley Price had to be translated into stock characters. I was interested in these forms, the Peking opera and the Chinese landscapes as akin to iron ore, having a kinship with iron ore, as resources embedded in the Chinese landscape that I could dig up and use to process this narrative ore from Tom Price. I saw my work as a kind of reenactment or continuation of the gesture that had been performed at this site. Mining for all its technological prowess and development is in many ways a primal activity. To dig out one's own or someone else's insides, literally the ground beneath our feet, to take a mountain and turn it into a hole in the ground, and ship it off to somewhere that mountain is deemed more valuable. To trade our substance for other substance. Very recently, I've also been thinking about it as related to the practice of hunting and gathering that has received some art historical attention of late. In preparing this talk, I found myself pausing on this quote from the political theorist Eshel Mbembe, who I mentioned in my introduction. He writes, it may be that the economy, every economy, with all its logical and technical aspects, ultimately boils down to just two activities, hunting and gathering. And that despite all appearances, we have never really moved beyond these. Now let's turn our attention back to Ramir. Here's an image of the factory. It was established in 1810 in the wake of the Russian-Swedish War in which Sweden lost control of Finland to Russia. And along with that loss, Sweden lost its glass industries. This resulted in something of a glass rush in which a number of different glass industries were developed in Sweden. Almost all of them have now outsourced their commercial glass production and exist as global brands. Ramira took a different path. 
unusual in the Swedish context in that it carries on the struggle to find a right scale for a commercial industrial glass factory to make glass products in Sweden. Like many industries, they have turned to tourism, especially essentially rendering the labor of their workers as a performance, as one way to supplement the income from their production by extracting further value from this labor. Despite this further extraction, it has been an economic struggle and the business of the factory has gone bankrupt multiple times over the time I've been working there. In 2015, I launched a new stage of my work there that I called Performing Labor. It's a somewhat elaborate project that radiates out from an attempt to create a set of conditions in which I and a group of colleagues could consider the evolving state of labor, art, craft, industrial, and tourist labor within the context of the Raymier Glass Factory. The work is in many ways an extension of my first observations upon entering the factory in 27. I was drawn to what I experienced as a kind of common violence in the way the tourist spectacle was being staged in this site. I wanted to make craft of this violence, to enter it, to become its subject and object as a way of knowing something about this place. I began by creating a guest worker program in the factory to be inhabited by artists. As I had already been working, I had already had been working in the town for eight years at this time uh, and had artistic research funding and knew the, the current factory owner fairly well. This was not the hardest part of the work. We negotiated the period for the artist guest worker program and I set the working conditions of, uh, of the artist guest workers to run parallel to those of the glass workers, determining that we should work the same schedule, be paid roughly the same wage, and be subject to the same tourist gaze as the other workers. It's important to say that none of these parameters are ethical. They're all functional and structural. I also implemented other structures to heighten the awareness of the situation, including commissioning an, an ethnography of labor to be conducted during the guest worker period, and a series of philosophical human resource workshops for all staff. In total, there were 13 artists, uh, artist guest workers in the program, each charged with producing a product of and about labor that were featured in a product catalog. One of the participant uh, artists was Robin Backen. Um, in this presentation, I'm focusing on the forms and my own contributions to them, not the other artists' work that was involved. And also, uh, they were featured both uh, in, in this product catalog and also in an exhibition in which the works were integrated into the existing displays of the historical museum. Uh, these images show one of the two sites where the work was located. This is the workers' break table in the factory which has, in the time I have been there, always been strewn with an assortment of product catalogs. I was interested in how these objects were used and engaged with in the sp space of the frequent short breaks the glass workers take to break up a physically demanding work process, and wanted to engage this space as a site of analysis of the research results from the performing labor period. The product catalog I produced was inserted into the pile of existing catalogs to remain there until someone removed it. Last I checked, now five years later, it is still there. I was interested in both of these forms, the product catalog embedded in the context of the break table and the encounter with the objects embedded in the existing narrative of the historical museum as a means of rearticulating the practice of research analysis. If traditionally the analysis of research results is a knowing act performed by the researcher who is authorized to think and know, then what does an unknowing analysis look like and permission? 
I sometimes refer to this structure that I'm interested in in relation to art and its audiences as an encounter between an accidental audience and an object of uncertain origin. I am deeply interested in this state of encounter, both as a strategy for exhibiting art and as a way of rethinking the project of knowing. So I was interested in this product catalog slipped into a break table in the factory full of aging product catalogs and in casting the act of research analysis into this space and time. The space time of being on break, a designated temporal moment of non-labor, heavily circumscribed by labor to give a sense of how heavily circumscribed in the glass factory, the breaks are five to 10 minutes. And the encounter with an object, in this case, a product catalog that passes in the hands of a glass worker from a seemingly known object to an unknown to renown. And in making a claim for the value of this thin liminal plane of uncertain space time as a critical site of analysis. We come back now to that moment of Novi. This is a cup. We are together. Similarly, I was interested in recasting the labor of the tourist as a form of vital research analysis. As one who encounters an object in the tourist museum as it passes from seemingly known to unknown to renown. This latter setting, the embedding of the works into the historical museum was an important beginning for my individual contribution to the project, which I will focus on now in more detail. The product I produced for the performing labor product line was born of an engagement with a number of threads that coalesced during the artist guest worker period. The first was an old interest in a video that I, I had encountered in the historical museum on my first visit to the factory that had been rattling around in my head for the past eight years, waiting to become something. The video, a still screen of which appears here, depicts a series of curious actions that I later came to understand more literally, but retained some of their symbolic and poetic excess. The video depicts a group of people assembling on a frozen lake, cutting a hole in the ice, a diver entering a hole, and an object being pulled out and examined. The video is then in turn displayed in the historical museum, along with the objects they found, and tells the story of this cable car cart that used to run through the region, carrying raw materials in and glass products out. At some point in time, one of these carts went astray and fell into the nearby lake, depositing its cargo with it. Another thread was this building across the street from the factory. You would look out on it when you sat on the front steps of the factory on break. It used to be a hostel and was instrumental to our early programs in Raymier as an affordable place to house the groups of artists we assembled here for workshops and residencies. The hostel had been closed to tourists and our artist groups and converted in 2013 into a housing for newly arrived people, primarily fleeing wars in Syria and Afghanistan. This was a familiar phenomenon during the period where rural sites were repurposed as temporary refuges for newly arrived people while implicitly better housing was built for them in nearby cities. So for the performing labor period, we commuted from the nearby village of Kalbo each morning at 6.15 a.m., do you remember this? To arrive on time for our 6.45 a.m. shift. Looking out at this building, it struck me that this temporary revaluation of the village for the purpose, for the purpose of what I began to refer to as refugeeing was an important transformation of our understanding of the products being produced by this factory town. The question emerged, how does a factory town built to produce glass learn to produce refuge? 
The work I wound up making constituted an attempt to address this question. I began to think to myself that one practice, that one way to practice this practice of refuging, a transformation of the product from being a place, uh, of our understanding of it from being a place or person to a practice or set of actions, would be to operate on time. To create a condition in which the one who comes seeking refuge finds that they were already there. Another important thread that emerged during this time was another video. I was both an artist guest worker and somehow by default, some kind of manager of the guest worker program. Within my role as manager, I sometimes engaged in a particular form of labor that is far less pathologized in studio art than in other industries. This involves doing things deemed non-work activities during what is deemed work time on my computer, such that they could from the outside, viewed by a passing tourist or a glass worker or another artist guest worker, resemble productive work. One of these activities that I assigned myself was to watch tourist videos from other places. I have a long standing interest in tourist videos as a form and I found myself drawn to a curious video posted to YouTube produced by a couple on their honeymoon. <laughs> Who decided to spend their honeymoon visiting a community of loggers and logging elephants in the teak forests of Myanmar. Further research led me to understand the perilous shifting labor conditions of these soon to be unemployed elephants who had been broken into the teak logging industry. The teak forest had been over-harvested and the work depicted in this video was rapidly losing its economic viability. The elephants in turn joined the unemployed. I was interested to learn that there were few labor options available for them and about the relationship between different labor types and their lifespan. In the wild, these elephants lived to approximately 56 years old. Employed in logging, their lifespan dropped to 52 years. Most of them were being sold into the tourism industry in Thailand, but unfortunately the lifespan of an Asian elephant employed in tourism drops to 26 years, half a life lost in shifting labor conditions. As a comparison, the average lifespan of an elephant in a zoo is approximately 12 years. It occurred to me that this relationship between the elephant's industrial logging labor and the tourist spectacle production labor connected them in a way to this site in Ramira. And I set out to explore what it would mean to bring a group of them there to make a refuge for them in Ramira. I began this work through the performing labor product line and set out to make a product that experimented with this temporal operation I described above. To perform this act of refuging, by creating a condition in which the one who comes seeking refuge, in this case, a small herd of unemployed logging elephants from Myanmar, finds that they were already there in Ramira. I did this through something of a media artist wordplay. In the media production industries, DVDs, most of you are, you're all old enough to know a DVD, right? Um, uh, DVDs were produced in two ways by consumers through laser etching or burning and industrially by pressing. For the pressing technique, you use an original that is called a glass master. The same term used to refer to those in the highest status role in a glass factory. So I set out to explore the production of a glass master. I wanted to take this tourist video that I found of the logging elephants in Myanmar and make a glass master of it through the assistance of another kind of glass master. I embarked on a process of learning how to make glass plates and designed a process for making them in private, making an enclosed space on the factory floor where the glass workers could make glass without being seen. Inside this space, we developed a process to make glass plates. The process involved pouring a glass gather onto a steel plate and then taking a moistened stick and pressing the glass mass from above 
for as long as the worker could stand the steam coming off the stick. It had some relationship to ritual bathing practices, and I developed a short meditation that, would, that we would do prior to making glass in this way that brought the workers back to the bodily experience of their first contact with glass as a material. The glass plates that emerged from this process had a curious texture, not unlike that of elephant skin. While I was developing this process and producing these plates, I had located and was negotiating with a DVD pressing facility to try to convince them to put my handmade glass plate into the machinery used to produce a glass master and to make a master of this YouTube video. The technicians were interested and tried hard to make it possible, but their machinery was extremely sensitive and would not accept anything but a perfectly flat glass substrate. Fortunately, I had been exploring other options and found a vinyl pressing company in France that made clear vinyl recordings. I sent them the audio extracted from the YouTube video and they sent back a clear vinyl recording containing the sounds of this small group of elephants, soon to be unemployed, engaging in their last logging labors. I sandblasted a recess into one of the glass plates forged a steel frame in the workshop of the blacksmith next to the glassworks, and made this thing that I called anything as my contribution to the performing labor product line. The description of the product read as follows. Title, anything made to be lost and perhaps later found, perhaps at the bottom of a lake, perhaps in early spring, perhaps when the ice is still thick and clear. Product description. Any things are best misunderstood a hundred years later, falling from a cable car of history into a lake of possible meanings. Raymira is a factory town first conceived in 1810 as a refuge, a refuge for Swedish glass. Now perhaps a last refuge, a new refuge. We are the resident refugees charged with the difficult craft of giving and taking refuge. A track once engaged is hard to exit, like the desire to exit itself and freely fall with a splash into the water. I then worked with the members of the Historical Society and asked them to take me on their skiff to the site where they had found the artifacts from the previous ice dive. They took me and waited patiently while I slipped the anything back into history. We then waited for the ice to freeze and came back in early spring with many of the same members as the previous ice dive, some members of the national press and local press, a dive team and a video crew. We cut another hole in the ice and entered the water. We searched for and eventually found the anything, it was brought back up to the surface. Opened and played on the ice, releasing its sounds over the surface of the Hoon Lake, steeping into the pine forests that surround the factory. This circulated as a local and uh, and and national press story about the discovery of these elephants uh, beneath the ice in Ramira. I then worked with the members of the Historical Society to acquire both the new video and the anything itself, appending the new video to their original video and adding the anything to their display of artifacts found at the site. This is where it now sits as part of their permanent collection. 
I've been working on different strategies for telling this story. And one of them has been through the vehicle of a lecture performance that I developed with the Romanian uh, performance uh, scholar, uh, Ioana Yukam, who was in Ramira and met with, uh, with Robin and functioned as the ethnographer in residence as part of uh, one of the roles that I, I cast for the performing labor work. These are some uh, images from the performance that we um, developed. Okay, uh, this work led to a next phase of my engagement in Ramira, an exploration of this practice of refuging that I am still in the midst of. I've continued to bring other artists into these investigations and to produce my own work within them. I will end today's talk by talking about this phase of the project, which brings us into the detox clean it up work that was mentioned in the announcement for my coming here. As I explored forms to further uh, understand this practice of refuging as Ramirez's new production, I began developing a plan and a proposal to bring a small herd of these now unemployed logging elephants to Ramira. After much exploration, I settled on doing this through a conceptual performance of architecture. At this point, it's helpful to understand um, something about the, the architect I wound up working with. Uh, around this time, I, I, I was uh, invited to serve as a guest professor of artistic research um, in Stockholm, and I was invited to come to this uh, facility and to make something there. And uh, in response to the invitation, I decided that what I wanted to make was that I wanted to pick this thing up and bring it to Rainier. And I was really interested in what would happen through a transposition of the values that made possible this structure in Stockholm. Uh, I'm gonna show a little video now where I talk about that. So refuging in Ramira is essentially a conceptual performance of architecture. We're standing here on this, this building site and you could say that it's, um, that it's uh, the early stages of, uh, of an architectural project. But as a conceptual performance of, of architecture, it could also be the end stage. It could be done. In, in the sense that when, when, you, when you approach a space like this, you, you understand that, that something is going to be built here. Um, and one of the things I'm really interested in, in this conceptual performance of architecture is this question of where gets architecture? So like, we often think about who gets architecture, but also where gets architecture? And when I first started this project uh, several years ago, I was working in Stockholm, and I was invited to make something inside of this uh, really spectacular uh, geodesic pavilion that they had there. It was a dome structure built by the Danish architect Christopher Tjelgaard. It was called Dome of Visions, and it was at KTH in Stockholm. And I remember being really struck by the logics that made this really spectacular piece of architecture reasonable at this site in Stockholm, that it was reasonable to spend all this money to build this really spectacular structure that would only stand for a year or two because it was totally accepted that Stockholm is a place to think about the future and has a future. And I was really interested in what it would mean to transpose those logics of architecture onto our site here in Raymira where futurity is a much more precarious proposition. The, the structure that, that, will, that will be built here is a, um, a smaller version 
of the planned 5,000 square meter elephant refuge that would be sited just behind the factory over here. And this space that we're going to start building next summer together with the community um, is a refugee pavilion. And its purpose is for it to be built. Um, it's, a, it's a necessarily unnecessary building. Um, so it's, uh, it, it looks the way it looks because uh, it needs to be unnecessary. Uh, because if we're going to have some chance of undoing, of transforming the logics of industry and capital that have shaped places like this, factory towns, and in some sense the world at large, and the people who inhabit those spaces, then I think we need some kind of uh, spectacularly unnecessary um, mass. Um, and the, the, the proposition is that it's not through the locating of this building here that this transformation happens, that, that we refuge, but through the building of it itself, so through the act of building. And this is very closely linked to the logics of craft production that are at, inside the origin story of this place, right? It was, it was, it was um, created in order to manufacture and produce glassworks. And so those, those, um, those ways of knowing, those craft ways of knowing are embedded in this site and they've been trained for the purposes of, of, of industry, but they always have, all, all practices have excess. And this refugee project really tries to draw on that excess to say, we've developed a capacity to know through making here. Um, and how can that capacity be deployed in order to make this new thing called refugee? The, uh, the land where we wanted to build this refuge uh, turned out to be contaminated, a major problem that we had encountered during the performing labor work and one that had come to the fore at, in the most recent bankruptcy proceeding at the factory. The waste from 200 years of production had transferred from, from a private to a public good and thus a public responsibility. Basically, what happened was that when the factory went bankrupt, they did a calculation of what it would cost the new owner to clean up after the 200 years of waste that had been pushed behind the factory that were contaminated with arsenic and lead and found that it would wipe out all of the carefully extracted profits produced by the factory over the years and make the sale of the business totally unviable. As a result, the local politicians step in, stepped in and agreed to save the factory as a cultural and economic asset by making the waste a public responsibility. I saw this as an important opportunity to enter this process of waste remediation as an artist-run, long-term, place-based research organization located in Ramira. My partner and I approached the municipality and proposed that we be appointed to the working group charged with determining how to clean the site and allocate the public funds that would be used on this project. We stipulated that as members of this group, we wanted to commission an artist pre-study of the site that would be considered in a co-equal status along with all of the other expert testimony that was being commissioned by hydrologists, soil scientists, and geologists. The municipality agreed, and this launched us into a three-year project that we called Detox Clean It Up which resulted in this publication, a pre-study of the contaminated land, which is now being considered by the municipality as part of the cleanup effort. Contains documentation from several of the artists work and their proposals from the site. The next stage in my own contribution to this work involved an attempt to rethink the usual logics of public art funding where in a small amount, usually 1% of the budget is allocated to art. I proposed instead that 99% of the cleanup budget be allocated to art. In order to build this 5,000 square meter refuge for unemployed logging elephants from Myanmar, and that in the process, we would take care of the subtask of waste remediation.
is from a museum exhibition uh, that collects some of these, these elements and a 100 to 1 uh, model produced by the architect of the proposed 5,000 square meter refuge. The anything of the original YouTube video. A poem I wrote about the project and the, uh, one of the lean bonacarts. And some more images from the, the lecture performance. I'm going to go through very, very quickly because we're coming short on time. Um, while waiting for the government to advance the very slow research phase, I decided to test out this proposition of refuge in through the act of building. This involved an architectural scale community building project that resulted in what I referred to as a smaller refuge in pavilion. The community build was realized this past June. There's some uh, of the images from the building permit and uh, images from the building process. The work involved designing and implementing a ritualized building practice. This began with an open invitation to the community to come in whatever state they were. It was vital in my understanding of refugee that we recognize the challenge of this practice and welcome people's resistance, despair, uncertainty as part of the process. I designed a building method working in partnership with the Swedish social choreographer Anna Asplund that involved the use of memories as the building blocks of the architecture. I settled on three types of memories, memories of feeling safe, feeling free, and feeling loved, along with their accompanying counter emotions. The practice involved a preparatory act of having gloves put on your hands and then working in a team of two the builders worked alternating between two roles. One was the role of the person who offers a memory, and the other was the role of the listener. The one who offered a memory did so by inserting a series of bolts into these recycled polycarbonate sheets, allowing the memory to de develop over the course of these insertions. The listener's job on the other side of the plate was to screw these bolts into place by hand using a specially designed memory affixer that pulled and secured the memories into the building. So the result is a pavilion that looks like a piece of architecture, but is really an attempt to practice refuging. I'm gonna close with a little um, time-lapse video of the, the build. The structure will now be used over the coming two years to host international and regional artists to produce a refugee toolkit that contains other articulations of how this complex practice of refugee might be developed and how Ramira, as a site for producing refuge, might become a world leader in the field. So I'm going to stop there and uh, we'll let this run. And I really would love to hear what's on your minds. I'd like to give you a big clap. I want to make a comment. Mm. Um, it's all, it always amazes me how you put things together. Thoughts that grow. You know, while I watched you in that first pro, that labor, performing a labor project. I had no idea what you were doing. I mean, I knew what I was doing. Right. Watching you grow this idea, it's so uh, unusual in the way that you understand how to create something. Mm -hmm. How do you want, what do you identify yourself as now? I mean, <laughs> yeah. really, mm -hmm. you cross over. I mean, I, I, I don't, yeah, I'm not so... I'm not so invested in kind of the uh, like, like the identity project. I'm really interested in. Um, I, I often think within this type of practice about this notion of the sacrificial self. So, like, I came into Tom Price, and I'm like, what are the opportunities of my perceived identity? Right, my perceived identity as an American artist, and I'm pretty far as like a, a New York Jew, like descendant of of people fleeing persecution from like this Protestant Tom Price. But at the same time, uh, I, I could stand in, in this community. 
<laughs> you know? um, so it's, it, it's partly thinking about kind of how can I think in a very kind of plastic way about how to deploy what I identify as. Right? Um, in that case, like how could I be this, 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 this kind of um, mineral prospector who comes into this place and, and, and performs this kind of another kind of extraction. And I'm really interested also in the permissions that are accorded to us within this role of artist and the way that artist um, is a, um, is, is a license to be in the world that we can expand access to beyond ourselves and, and our bodies. And that's where I'm really interested. I'm not very interested in, in museum shows, but I'm very interested in museums as a platform, right? So when I, I did that, that, um, that show that I, uh, that I showed you images of, that was a really important space to bring the local politicians and to have them sit around this model, not at their conference table in the, in, in the regional government, and to, to access the permission to allow themselves to want this thing. And that's actually what the head of the, of the regional government said when, when he came with his staff. He said, I want this and I want the elephants. <laughs> and I don't know that he would have said that if we'd had that meeting at the, at, at, you know, at, at the governmental head. So I, I'm, I'm really interested in those kind of permissions and how we can, how we can work with them um, and, and use them to expand the, um, the scope of, 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 of what we deem possible and how we live. I think you cross over so many zones of thought in the process. I mean, I definitely had to enter uh, certain kinds of architectural thinking um, through this, this project. Um, I just want to open it up yeah, to anyone else who would like to ask a question. I want to just have a look and see if there's anybody online that wants to ask a question at all. Um, come on, guys. This is the current state of the project. Yeah, and it's a, yeah. <laughs> so how has it embedded itself? How, yeah. how have the community who um, assisted or supported or worked on it, how is it, how is it um, being used? Yeah, so... I mean, as I say in the piece, the use is, is like the use is the act of building. So it's actually really important to me. Not, I mean, that's, that's the kind of one of the operations I'm performing in the work is that normally architecture is permissioned by its program, right? In, our, in architecture, the program is like what the building is for, what it does, right? So what gives, what gives permission for architecture to exist is that it has a program. And part of the operation of this work is to deny program, to say there is no program. The program is just for it to be built, right? That, that, and it's really important to permission that as the primary program. Because if we, if we say like, we're gonna come together as a community and make a cultural center because we need a cultural center, or we're gonna make an artist residency because we need an artist residency, then we instrumentalize that labor, right? And we, 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 we lose the capacity to actually inhabit and own this act of revaluation asking this question about like uh, under uh, on what kinds of, of of logics can we revalue ourselves in this place oh you just I'm just taking the okay you're bringing the the, 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 the zoom people up okay yeah sure they can I can see them over here too sure yeah um, that's nice um so uh, but at the same time I uh, I'm not dogmatic about those things. So that, that part of it happened. Yeah. And uh, I know I, I trained a group, an ensemble to uh, be part of this refugee and build team. So we introduced people to the practice. Some of us did it with them, this memory exchange. And it was incredibly intimate and intense. And I was very committed to not documenting that work. I mean, people were basically um, you know, sharing memories of feeling safe, feeling loved, and feeling free, and it felt like it would be deeply ironic to make that the subject of, <laughs> of, of documentation. So actually, I didn't allow anyone into the site who wasn't engaged in this refuge, and so I, I had to create a barrier through um, a welcome table where people could learn about the project and then decide if they wanted to enter and participate and if they did, they received this series of talismans that were actually made by my daughter that represented the 
building principles of the site. The, the principles were of um, curiosity um, about oneself and, and, and others, uh, a, um, uh, or a, an acceptance that within this space, passivity and activity uh, were treated as, as equal. Um, there was a third principle that is escaping my mind now. And uh, they, um, they received those in the form of these talismans that were then put into a felt pouch and put around their neck. And that felt pouch also contained the nuts that they would use to pull the memories into the structure. So they would get their memory affixer when they came inside. Um, but I, so I know a lot about kind of what the experience was of building um, and what people's experience was of building. Um, but in terms of what the facility winds up becoming um, and how it winds up, what kinds of desires people have for it, uh, I don't know. It remains to be seen. Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, in, in the Maxwell, and um, that was fantastic and intoxicating and quite wonderful. It makes me feel that we're well beyond. <laughs> You, 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 you ask what's in our minds. Mm. I want to raise something that was raised back in May when in the seminar. Mm. And for me, it comes down to three propositions that you put to us, which I think are very productive. We're not knowing, knowing and a reconfiguration of epistemology and finding a way to uh, dwell with that, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But the complexity of in this place where we are in Australia, of talking about being already there, but the complexity in Australia, at the moment in our history, of thinking of, about what it is to enter this place, because we have entered it wrongly. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one potential I see in what you're talking about is a, a playful, a deadly, serious, playful, reconfiguring of time and in a sense as we're thinking about this well, I'm just right now as well but what you're affording us mm -hmm. is, is is about a, a second beginning perhaps mm -hmm. in this place where we do start to interrogate what it means for a settler a settler culture to be misentered and, and mm -hmm. you know, the entire thing that Australia is at the moment is an anxiety about this country. So anyway, that's what's in my yeah. I, I, yeah, I really appreciate that. And I it's um it's been on my mind a lot coming here and thinking about presenting this work here. And I I, I think it's um I'm I'm glad that you're glimpsing something in that way. Uh, I should say like from my perspective coming to this small factory town in in Sweden um, where uh, the, the, the structural relations are very different, right? So I'm really, I'm thinking a lot about what it is to come to Sweden as a refugee and what kind of, of license you have to participate in Swedish history, right? And, and what happens if, we, if, if you abdicate that to those who, who have been given or, or, uh, or accorded rightful control of that narrative, right? Um, so it's a very different structural relationship and saying, and, and these institutions, like these historical societies, they're, they're volunteer organizations that are composed of different local people who have deep investments in their version of this narrative. And it's really through the, it's one of the things I've really learned as an artist about this kind of practice is it was only through the force of returning there and now 15 years in, in, in returning that I realized the, how dangerous this idea is of fixing uh, history and who has who, who has access to it and just how false it is, right? That actually there's zero conceit in this work and that's really important to me. I don't say like, let's pretend this was part of this dive. I say, I've been here for 15 years. So the things I've made are obviously part of the history of this factory. The things the artists I brought here have made are obviously part of the history. To tell the history of this factory and to ignore those those, um, the, you know, those things would be ridiculous, right? Um, and, and so when I come, I say, I tell them, I say, 
take me to this site and we'll put this thing here together. And we go back to find it and we're, we know it's there. We're going to go find it, you know? Um, and then it comes out and I say, will you take it? You know, will you take it as part of the history? And they convene. And just to say, even though there's no conceit, there can be incredible discord. There was a huge upheaval about the man who shot that, the first video, um, is quite famous in the region. He's a former football star, and he was the head of the historical society. And even though I had told them all of this, he felt tricked. He, he, when it happened, he realized what it was, and he felt tricked, and he got very angry with the head of the historical society, and he convened an, an emergency meeting to say about this acquisition. And in the end, the, 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 the group, the historical society came together and, and despite his opposition said, we have to accept this object. Oh, Daniel, um, I'm just feeling overwhelmed with the ideas that you presented or shared with us today, which are exciting, not in a sense of my own overwhelmment, but just the level of ideas, just that fantastic. Thank you. In, in reflecting on what I just asked about those who came before or those who are here before, I'm wondering if you could offer some reflections on those who come after or have come after. Mm -hmm to, in a way, although periods of time have elapsed through all of these elements that you shared with us today, they're an event or a, a, an intervention, in a sense, into a time and a place. And I'm just wondering about how those who come after relate to the creators or the people who were there at the time, because presumably the town changes over time in terms of people and just how that might be re interacting with the ongoing project. Yeah fact that there is something here and how do we take it up as a new generation Just yeah anyway, thank you. no thanks really nice question um I say I, i'm really interested in that question actually um maybe not exactly in the way that you're asking but i'll, I'll reply in the way that i think about it so for example um uh, i remember when i did the project in tom price i got a contact from uh one of the uh, from the mother of a child who had come to the opera saying that he wanted to buy the poster for the opera for his room. And, um, and I was really interested in that, like in what it is to grow up with that. And maybe he then has a sibling who like comes into the world and there is this poster in the room. And it, I, 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 I love those kind of spaces, like the space of like art in homes and how we relate to it, particularly as children. Um, and the, the way that this kind of, the insertion of this narrative creates a kind of space of possibility that then of course it is inevitable. Like there is some relationship between Tom Price and Chinese opera, right? Or in China, right? And then if you can read the, the Chinese, then you actually can also see the story there. That, that relationship exists, right? Um, and I, I'm, I'm really interested in that space of how, um, how those who come after uh, encounter a, uh, a work that exists, that exists through it having been called into being, through the effect of it being present in the space. So similarly, you know, when the elephants come, they, like people will be, oh yeah, I saw on the news that they were here, you know, so I, or, I think someone read something in the paper about this. You know, um, I'm really interested in that kind of space of um, uh, that. Actually, there are ways in which this is this is not a kind of um, theoretical proposition, but actually the way that time functions, and that those who come after are not actually only in the after. Right? They're encountering um, everything else, and they can participate in that. Um, but of course, it is a big question for this project, which is so built on this logic of refuging through the act of building. Um, and, uh, and it's something I, I haven't thought as much about how they will engage with this space. I'll say that part of that maybe comes from the fact that uh, Tom Price was a very transient town. Ramier is, um, is not a town of transients, 
You know, it's a, uh, it's uh, it, there are not people aren't moving to Ramira. Um, so somebody will, I'm sure, somebody does. Um, but uh, because of that dynamic, it wasn't very like at the forefront of my thinking. But I have been thinking a lot about those who didn't participate, and that's part of why this invitation. Um, I thought it was sort of like a wedding invitation that I sent to everyone in the town. Um, and that as also a kind of, um, in that I said, you are already part of this work. And my sense that like through that act, like even just through the engagement of, oh, okay, they're building something new in, in Ramira, um, I, I was invited, that there's a way in which one has participated, you know, and that invitation might live on in someone's house, on their fridge, or, you know, or, yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to see if anybody, if anybody online wanted to ask a question at all. Don't want to put you in the. Uh, yeah, yeah, great. Sorry. That's a question. Sorry. That's okay. Go for it. Do you want to continue? You know, there's nobody putting their hand up. We'll yeah. just do it. Oh. <laughs> We're in the physical space. <laughs> Is that tension important to you? Like, you say that, like, all of these like this kind of like logic is like very intrinsic to your work I guess like elephants and Nordic countryside but like does that like is that is it like are you like kind of like revealing attention or would you say you're kind of like calming them into a kind of like like whole object as an artwork what was the last part I'm sorry am I revealing attention or like kind of like another word like kind of like Putting them together to make them whole, I guess. Calm mm. them, I guess. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I'm not sure if I if I think those things are separate. Um, it sounds. If I understand what you're asking, I would say probably both. Um, there's a. a I mean. There's, I'm, 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 I'm definitely interested in, um, in calling attention, maybe not revealing, but calling attention to, to tensions or, or some of the work that we, that we're in the midst of or reframing that work. Um, and I, but, but also I think in, in a way that is, um, that helps us to see that there is actually, um, that we've developed a capacity, you know, that we have, you know, we, we were called on to perform this act of refuging. And if we, if we take it seriously, then we now have a capacity. So three years later, the, those who called on us can say, well, we built better housing for people in a better place than where you are. Well, we can say maybe so, but we now know something about how to do this thing called refuging. So we're three years ahead of that place. And, um, and as a result, we, we remain a valuable place to, to do this work. So it's both kind of like activating this tension of the fact that, that like we were part of a system of systemic devaluation and that was just repeated with a new form of extraction, um, but also offering a way in which, another way of inhabiting that in which we might see that the work that we did is um, uh, is of like a, a kind of value that we that, that of a real value that we that we may be interested in in uh, claiming and inhabiting. Not sure if that answers your question, but a little bit. Yeah. yeah I was really interested in the way that you created this object, this anything. And then through the various processes of emerging it, recuperating it, and the way it circulates through the newspaper, you create this sort of um, circuit of affirmation, sure. which is this invitation in a sense that you put out, this object, this anything. Once it's been affirmed, only then does it really fully come into being, like fully realized through that circuit of time and, mm. and action. And eventually it's uh, fully affirmed in the local museum. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I'm looking at this building, I'm wondering whether that's sort of waiting for its um, affirmation as well within the town. Mm, really beautiful question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll think about that. Um, yeah, I, I, the, the, I, I appreciate the language of affirmation that you're bringing. It's not not a frame that I usually think the work through. So, I'll, um, yeah, it's. Um, I mean, I'm 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 very interested in their, um, in as I said, making a claim for these objects having a um, having a rightful place. Here, yeah, you know? yeah definitely yeah about yeah that exactly that they have a kind of agency and this 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 object belongs here so i'm interested in belonging and but i but i i, I like this i'll think about it thanks for offering that oh there's a question there a question oh Anne marie yeah. Anne marie Anne marie do you want to unlock yourself <laughs> okay can you hear me yes yeah faintly oh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. I'm I'm kind of reeling. I found that quite remarkable. And there's I don't quite know what my question is, but there's something, it's something about the generosity of the feeling space in this, where you seem you talk a lot about the thinking and on an ideational level, and yet the fundamental questions are profoundly generous on a feeling level. And so I'm really curious as to how you language that. It seems to be coded within, inside that sense of an unknowing space and a sacrificial self, but it pulses with feeling and yet it's all described in the doing and the being. And I'm fascinated by that. Mm. So I'm sorry, it's not a question. No, it's, it's <laughs> thank you. Thank you, it's really nice. It's yeah, it's a really nice observation, and um, I definitely feel in in this work that there's a, and I, it's why I began the way I did, you know, bringing my daughter in and talking about surrogacy, is that I think it's one of the things that I'm really invested in, in this kind of of. Um, of practice, which is like uh, engaged with the so-called social world, as though all practices weren't, you know, but is is engaged with the social world is how we can inhabit these practices in a kind of deeply vulnerable and intimate way. You know, oftentimes when we step out into the public, we like with our work, we also transform as a character and at the same time as being interested in this kind of sacrificial self, which I think is really um, helpful in relation to the kinds of identity projects that we often bring with us to how to enter a place, which is where like, you know, uh, we often seek to permission our existence there through some kind of identity marker, right? I belong because I am X, right? Thus I have the right to be in this place. And I'm really interested in how we can question that and claim other kinds of um, uh, other kinds of permissions and other kinds of rights to belong. <laughs> How's everybody going? Um, anybody expressing? We can also continue this. Um, over the next couple of weeks, if people in this room are mm. up and here. Yeah. But, um, we have a couple more minutes. I wanted to see if some, because sometimes somebody has a question that's yeah, like sitting with, no, no, but no, if no. not, it's okay. That's great too. Yeah. So if you'd like, if you have anything that's sitting there that you'd really like to ask, let's ask now. It's my new Finnish thing that I've learned from being <laughs> in Finland they is to, that they, they're so comfortable with quiet. Yeah. Quiet doesn't make people, they actually feel nervous when there isn't quiet. And when people don't leave that space, that like, okay, there's a pause. And I realize like, I feel anxious, like who's gonna feel it? And they're like, no, this is finally where we wanna be. You know? yeah. It'd be a little finished quiet. A little quiet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, I have another question. I'm, I'm intrigued um, uh, about the progress of, or well, the reception mm -hmm. of the town. Um, so re repositioning the frame to your inversion of the proposal to the community or the, uh, what do we call it? The, the, anyway, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. the waste, 1% artist, 99% civil engineering. Right. You know, hydrologist, etc. Yeah. In your proposal, you're inverting that um, formula. Yeah. Um, was that accepted? <laughs> so, um, uh, that's uh, that's my proposal. It's in the pre-study here. And it's very important to say, like, this is not a. These are real objects. Like, and these are real. Like, so this object was made. It's not an art book. You know, like you can read it too, um, but. Uh, but it's called a pre-study of the contaminated land in Ramira. And it contains a series of artworks. And one of them is this work I've described to you. And there, there are others really fascinating other works produced by people. So this is, and, and we have a real contract that says that they have to consider this research as co-equal with the other research which is being produced. But we did this, we thought it was a long project. This was three years. But if you're studying water flows, it takes much longer, actually, to understand the waste and how the waste is moving. So I say that to say, like, this is on their table now, but the hydrologist report is not. So the committee is, will, will, will reconvene. And then um, uh, when, when the studies have been done uh, and then make a decision. So that process hasn't happened yet and will be at that table. So we'll we'll get to 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 address it, um, but uh, I don't know what will happen, and uh, that process has been delayed. It's one of the really interesting things about working with um, with these kinds of development processes is that I think as artists we're so we're actually we're used to doing so much with so little, right? um, and uh, so in a sense I think this kind of like if you imagine what we could do with ninety nine percent of that cleanup budget it would be amazing, but at the same time uh, recognizing that these there's also some really like fascinating things for us to learn about the kind of time in which research happens in these other fields where they're just saying like well we need the time for the water to move from wherever the contamination is coming from to where we're monitoring it right and there's no way to like you can't um like you can't legislate that you know you can't regulate that i, I think i I'm, I'm just want to add on to that I'm having worked on that briefly last year with robin and i just think it's i i see that as being a very potent and fertile kind of space to imagine that um, artists as agencies of of comment invention etc whatever engagement is, is really fascinating mm. we've got sites which are you know like newcastle which eventually won't mine coal but we'll have these massive holes you know sitting there which are toxic because of the poisons that are leached up so they're they're, they're a complex and an interesting uh engineering problem yeah, yeah. it's a great possibility for um yeah, and I just want to say, like, maybe there's a closing comment. Is like, I think also those are those problems that you're identifying, like around mining sites in Australia. Was one of the proposals was that we would do like a seminar just around these mining remediation projects because in Australia they're quite heavily organized, right? And the, there's a deep time thinking where they start the project and they think all the way to the end, right? So like before they started the Tom Price mining operation, they removed the top layer of topsoil to save it until they were done. Really? But think about this, like think about the narrative logic, like no artist will ever make such a like such an interesting work, right? So the, 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 what they're gonna do is they're gonna take a mountain, make it into a hole in the ground, but they decide to save the topsoil, the skin of the mountain, as part of an effort to think the whole of their action and what they will do after they've done this that they're going to put the soil back. I mean, no artist will ever, will ever touch that, you know? And, 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 and to, to, to deny that there is some, some imagination, some like deep creativity in that thinking is, I just think like, um, it's a loss to us all.
for example, um, out west where they collected all the seeds from all the plants. Wow. wow. On top of that topsoil. Yeah. And then, you know, with a view to some further remediation. Yeah. But what about all the underground water channels? That yeah. About? I, mean, never back I mean, one of the, the proposals for the opera, one of the pieces of iron ore fragment was um, some of them you might have noticed were edited. So I, I, I removed some of them, but I left them in, in the fragments that I sent to the, to the, um, to the Chinese opera company. And uh, one of them is that, this is probably the most like, contentious of them, um, but there's also this one here where Rio Tinto agrees to the final recon reconciliation in a signing of the ore and commits to refill the mine with iron ore. You know? <laughs> I think like, and so, so that was sent and they still were like, you know, I was really curious, like how, like might they refuse my, my editing of it, you know? Um, and uh, might they refuse my editing of this section here, for example? Um, yeah, maybe we'll, that's a complicated place to end, but maybe we'll, maybe we'll end there. Thank you all so much for being with me.